That coming through okay? Yep, that was good. All right. So um, my project this year is kind of an extension of what I did last year in, in the sense that it's um, also a, a mobile application. Um, but this time I, I decided to do um, some radar products instead and some different things in the way I wrote the application. So it takes um, data from the, the thread server uh, that's produced by NCWMS, um, in this case it's radar data, uh, displays it on uh, Google Maps, the, uh, the Google Maps API. It also uses the Dropbox API as a, a sort of file server and the application is uh, written in JavaScript and that allows for uh, Apache Cordova to wrap it as a native application for um, any type of mobile platform. Uh, last year I wrote an application that was a native Android application and this is kind of like a you know, little bit of background on what I did last year. So like I said, it was a, a native Android application and it parsed through the XML on the uh, NetCDX subset service and produced a simple time series chart. This was um, a couple of variables from the GFS 80 kilometer uh, and again through the NetCDX subset service. And so it, it's kind of like a mobile version of this form. And I know it's kind of hard to see, but yeah, it's the, the form that I tried to, to replicate uh, last year for an Android-only application. So for this year, I um, wanted to create an application that will work on any mobile device and not just Android. And as for the product, we want to do radar this year because, I mean, I, I think it would be you know, more um, appropriate for a, a mobile device to be able to see it, you know, have, have the, the high resolution radar data that Unidata has on a mobile device. And also I know that paid versions exist of you know, high resolution radar, but like I have the data here, I can make it. And you know, that just to show that that sort of thing could be done. <coughs> so um, like I said, I used Apache Cordova. Um, it's also formerly known as PhoneGap. Um, because it lets me write a, a single JavaScript slash HTML file and it will wrap it as a native application. So all I had to do was download the, in my case, Android because I'm an Android phone. Um, all I had to do was download the Android SDK and write the file using regular JavaScript and HTML and it acts as a native application on my phone. Um, you can do the same with iOS if you have the uh, the iOS developer kit and you know many other platforms, the mobile platforms. And then as my developer environment, I use NetBeans because it has built-in functionality for uh, Apache Cordova. Uh, but this was also my first job, you know, true diving into JavaScript program. So I, I knew there'd be a bit of a learning curve with the language. But setting up a whole world for Cordova is actually pretty straightforward. Um, like I said, I installed the, the software developer kit for Android and just took the basic Google Maps API for JavaScript, uh, ran it through Cordova, and it worked as a native application on my phone. Um, I even, like, because I guess one of the things I was taking into consideration is because it's HTML JavaScript, I was thinking it needed to hit a website. But that's actually not the case. Um, I was able to turn off all communications, put it in airplane mode, turn off Wi-Fi, completely disconnect it from the internet, and the the application still loaded with some of the the cache maps. You know, of course, if I moved too far away, it would you know it would need to hit the internet to update it. But it still does work, you know, natively on the phone. Um, so then the next step was to draw the radar pixels, the, the, the radar data, on the maps. And I, I ran into some trouble with the, the technologies to be able to produce enough pixels. Um, I think the, the radar was something on the order of like a million pixels or something like that for a single station. 
And just by drawing polygons on Google Maps, I could only get, you know, this is 50,000. And it took a good deal of time to, to draw on my computer in Chrome, you know, and it didn't even work on my phone. If I get up to 100,000, the page just crashes. And so there, there wasn't enough there to be able to directly draw the data from the files onto the map. So I looked at other technologies. This was uh, data-driven documents. Um, it actually got up to around 260,000 pixels, but still couldn't quite reach the, the 1 million that a, a radar file would hold. So the next idea was to look into an Apache server with file stash. And the way that would work is the image would go to a, a server, and then tile stash would go in and only pull the relevant files, almost kind of the same way that Google Maps works. Is, you know, you have the entire map, but it only pulls in the tiles that are relevant. Um, as we were getting ready to set that up, it was introduced to the composite radar. And this was nice because it already tiles for me. And I don't know how well you can see it, but you know, it starts off with the national map, but you can zoom in, and it will adjust the resolution accordingly as you zoom in. Um, the other nice thing is that it gives me, or it, it'll produce a uh, KMZ file, and that's just you know, a zip KML, which goes nicely in with Google Maps. So I started using this approach with the uh, composite. Um, thing is, it, it couldn't take, directly take the link from Thread to, when I was you know, making the, the request from the composite, it wouldn't directly go into Google Maps. So this is google.com slash maps. I take the, the copy link for the KMZ, and it doesn't work. Um, and also, downloading it, you cannot put a local file on google.com slash maps to get it to show. So I was actually talking to Sean about this, and he put the file on a file server, and we fed the link, fed the, the website the link, and it, the KMZ showed up perfectly. So somewhere between then and while I was working on this, that also stopped working, because we, we loaded it on the file server, and then we did a, a direct link to Dropbox, and it worked, but now the google.com slash maps stopped working, um, which is kind of odd because in the code that I ended up writing, the direct link from Dropbox actually works with the Google Maps API. It just doesn't work on google.com slash maps. So that was what I was going to show you here, but it doesn't work anymore either. So anyway, um, uh, I did use the, the Dropbox API, and it's kind of a, a run through of how that works and how it gets the um, the, the KMZ on there. Um, the when, when the application loads, the Dropbox client looks to see if it's already been authenticated, and if the user has logged in before, application continues on like normal. If not, it opens up with the what they call the in-app browser and ask the, the user to sign into their personal Dropbox account. And what this will do is it allows the app to store the files in their personal Dropbox instead of managing a, a file server just for the images to go back and forth to their phone. And so they, they sign in with their personal account. They don't even have to have the, the Dropbox app on their phone as long as they have a Dropbox account, it's all that matters. So when they, they sign in, the application then creates a folder in their Dropbox automatically and then asks for permission to work inside of it so that the application doesn't mess with anything else in their Dropbox, only within the folder that it made. Um, but that, I did have some interesting bugs with uh, the, the Dropbox authentication. And it was kind of walked through one of the, I guess, frustrating slash entertaining bugs. Um, and this is on the authentication. I, I put in trace statements at every step so we can see how it goes. Um, first step is setting the authentication to uh, the, the authentication driver to recognize it's a Cordova app. That worked. Uh, the next step was to start the authentication. 
Will that work? The next step would be, if there's an error, give me an error message. If not, tell me it works. And so it went to, this works. So the authentication did not give an error, according to this. So this works. So the next step, I'm going to write a basic hello world text file. Nothing too fancy, just straightforward. If it's an error, give me the error. If not, it's written successfully. There's an error saying authentication failed, even though it just said there was no error in authentication. So end up fighting with this for a little while. Come to find out the problem was NetBeans. Um, in some way, I'm not exactly sure what it does, but when NetBeans runs the application or runs the packaging, it actually um, messes with something that makes that in-app browser to authenticate Dropbox makes it not load. And the way around that is to run the, the packaging Cordova stuff through the command line. So once I figured that out, I was doing pretty good. So anyway, this is what the app looks like when it, it loads up regularly. Um, it's just, you know, it's nothing too fancy. There's a, a Google map that takes up most of the screen and a button that starts the entire process to refresh the radar. Um, go through a, a walkthrough of how it works. I've already shown the, the Dropbox end of things. Um, the next step, uh, I know the text kind of small and fuzzy through the, the connection, um, but the, the top one is the HTML catalog for the radar file. The middle is the XML version of that that I'm parsing through, and the bottom is the code that actually parses it. And so I parse through the XML and threads to find the most recent day. And then from that, I open up that catalog and find the most recent file. And so then I take that file name, go into NetCDS subset service to find the end time variable. And I save that for the request I'm going to make for threads. So I pull in the, the last radar image that was made. Um, then I pull in the bounding box coordinates, um, again, for the, the threads request. And this is coming from the uh, boundaries of the Google map when they hit the refresh radar button. Uh, then the request is made to threads, and a KMV is returned as a blob variable type. And so, like I said, there, there's you know, all the parameters the bounding boxes from Google Maps and the time was just parsed out through XML. That blob data type that contains the XML is then written to the user's Dropbox. And I used for, uh, so each refresh is a unique name. The final name is actually the time plus the bounding box. Um, I was running into a problem by just using a generic name like test.pmz. If I, I wrote a test.pmz and loaded it, then I wanted to refresh it. I would delete the old test.kmz and look, create a new one. Google cached the old one and didn't recognize that they were going to change. So I just kept going back to the old image. So in order to get around that, each one now has a unique, um, a unique file name if the bounding box changes or if it moves, or if the, the, the time changes. So that eliminated that problem. Um, once the KMZ file is written to the user's Dropbox, Dropbox then gives me that download link URL, and that is then displayed in a Google Maps KML layer. So that, that URL that Dropbox made, even if I have it printed out and copy it to google.com slash maps, that still doesn't work. But for some reason, if I feed it into a KML layer, it works on my phone, so I don't know why it just does. Um, so anyway, it returns a, a nice radar image. Um, the next step we're looking at was animating. Um, again, I don't know how well you can see it, but there are time series radar data available in threads, and I tried taking the, the KMZ that was created by this animation. And it works fine in Google Earth, 
because each image is tied to a time. Um, so in this case, it's showing all of the images because the time bar is from 6 to 6.30. But I could go you know, 6 o'clock, 6.05, 6.10, and it would show the progression of the radar images. Unfortunately, as far as I could find in you know, the time I had, I, I don't know if Google Maps has the ability to toggle time, and if so, how you would even go about doing that. Um, I looked around and you know, couldn't find anything. Um, so that's not to say it can't be done. I just couldn't figure it out in the time I had. Um, so the backup plan was a, I guess, a brute force trick to download multiple single image TMZ files. So where I was going back and finding the most recent time, I'm now going back and finding the three most recent times and creating three individual K and Z files that I then toggle between, you know, toggle their visibility on and off with a, a next image button. Um, the problem with this is that it is extremely slow and probably taking in too much data than what's necessary. Um, and then the transition between toggling one layer on and one layer off is also pretty slow. Um, so for future work, you know, for the for this project, um, some things that could be done for the app is you know, to work on speeding it up. Um, I do think if there is a way to speed up the Google Maps, uh, like the the time part where it was working in Google Earth but not Google Maps, I think that would help speed a lot. And I'm also sure that there's something in my code that can be sped up as well. Um, something else that could be done is other radar products. Um, right now I'm only working with reflectivity. And the thing is, if at least as far as I could find, there are other products that for composites on the single image KMZs. As far as the time series go, I could only find uh, that for reflectivity. Um, and uh, something else would be that uh, Sean suggested was some model data. I think he said the fur model is in a similar format. Let's just make another request and overlay it with radar. And then um, the final thing that would be nice to talk about on and off is that color bar legend in the top left of the screen. I don't know if anyone noticed, but it was pretty large. And actually, whenever a, um, whenever a layer is first opened, it, the, the map zooms out to fit both the color bar and the image. And so whatever the bounding box was is now smaller, and you have to zoom back in to get back to where you were. So the ability to toggle that on and off also would be something to look into. Um, but other than that, that is my project. And whatever. Whatever question. Question for you? I have a minor one. Um, you said that we have to keep remaining files because Google has passed them. Did you need to? Um, did that cause a memory problem elsewhere later on? Um, I, I don't know like how long it was clearing the cache. Um, I, I just know that if I used the same file name, it returned the first file that was written in that name, even if it had been deleted and replaced by another one. Um, I haven't run into any memory problems, but that's not to say that it doesn't exist on a smaller scale. I got, I got a question. What do you think of JavaScript as development? I mean, too low level or is it just part of it? Um, it, it was similar and different in, I guess, some ways because the, the, my first language, my native language, is, is Java. And so there, there is definitely some similar structure, but there is also, I mean, I, I had to learn, you know, 
how the different things interact, especially between the the multiple languages interacting between JavaScript and HTML and occasionally CSS. I mean, I didn't go too far into CSS, but you know, trying to figure out how everything interacts. I mean, it wasn't too terrible, but it, there's definitely, um, I guess, it took a little bit more time on the debugging to figure out what was going on because I wasn't familiar with the language. Um, and I was running into problems also with um, the, the debugging because the emulator I was using in my, in my Chrome browser, it was running into issues with a cross-platform cross request because I was going from you know, whatever my site was to threads and that was throwing, throwing some errors. And so once I hit to that point, it didn't like me anymore and I had to debug through alerts on my phone that made me hitting OK, OK, OK a bunch of times to, to progress through the app to see you know, where it was breaking. So I, I'm sure there were more efficient ways for me to debug, but um, yeah, I mean, as far as JavaScript itself, I, I didn't think it was too much of a lear learning curve, but it's still, you know, I'm not 100% like um, fluent in it like I am some other languages. That answers your question. I don't know. <laughs> Okay, I guess nothing else. Uh, John, thank you, and we'll All right, so for those of you who don't know who I am, I am Florida Rodriguez, and I am from Texas, just graduated from Texas a and and this summer, I spent my internship working with IPython notebooks and visualizing National Hurricane Center's um, hurricane shots that they released through um, AT, ACTF files. So, um, ACTF, sorry. Um, so, first of all, where did I get my data from? So, I got my data from the NHC's FTP web um, kind of like archive stuff. Um, so ATCF automated topical cyclone forecast data files. So I had to get really four different types of files just for the storm data. And the reason why was because the National Hurricane Center organizes their data in different locations. Pre-2014, they're in uh, their archive file. And post-2014, they keep them in a different file. It actually took Sean and I some exploring through all of their tabs to find it. Um, and then also they have different decks, what they call. So there's like A deck, um, I think E deck and B deck, but primarily I work with the A deck and B deck because the A deck is our forecasted model stuff and B deck is their best track data. So as you can see here, this is just kind of what I use to create the path for, to get the files. Um, and then I also used another data file, which was a text file that had their running storms list. Um, so this is, again, the URL for that. And this is kind of a sample of what's in these files. So essentially, each line is for a storm, for one storm, and they date back to 1851. So you're looking at a lot of lines of, you know, storms. But essentially from the storm, really the only thing I used was the storm name, of course. The basin where it is would vary from that landscape, East Pacific, Central Pacific, et cetera. 
And there's storm numbers, so what storm, those are the first storm, second storm of the season. The year, and lastly, and probably what I thought to be the most important part was this last part, which is kind of the last part of the file name, um, which made it really easy to get the file without having to combine all of the information. Um, a thing that I thought was a little interesting and that I had, but I realized when I started reading in this data was, so the storm numbers are kept for each basin. So base, like that Atlantic basin has a storm number one, the East Pacific basin has a storm number one. So whereas the storm names might differ, the storm numbers could be the same. So I had to keep track that I was really pulling the first storm from the Atlantic basin and not from the East Pacific basin. So. Um, also, I used another file that had model information. And this took fun and I also some time to find. Um, but this was to kind of clear up the list of models that the National Hurricane Center puts in their, in their data files. So as you can see here, this is again, you know, four lines from the file. So over here is what they call the tech name. So it can vary AP01, you saw like all sorts of these. And essentially it's the tech name for each of the models. So you see here the last two, AP01, AP02. Those are the DSS ensemble members one and two. So this essentially would go like AP22 for the 22nd ensemble member of the DSS. And when I first started filling in these models, I saw, wow, I have a list of models that's like 50, or it's 50 plus, but 30 of those are just DSS. And no one wants to see model member, like ensemble member 13 of the DSS. We want to see them all together. So this file was really important because it was I was able to group together all the tech names for just the ensemble. Um, so that was a good find, and like I said, it helped. And um, I just kind of, to do it together, I just kind of did, you know, look at the information. If it starts with CFS Ensemble, then it's just grouped together, um, just kind of rough grouping, um, nothing really specific. Um, okay, so now we're going into Pandas. So now this is dealing with the storm data files. So going back to the forecasted files, best stock files. So a little bit about pandas. Um, it has a you can read into pandas and it reads in a lot of different types of files. Um, Thomas CSV, Excel, text, a lot of various ones. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to just put in the file to read into pandas, and I've had trouble with this in the past using pandas. Just you know, the, there aren't any column headers or column names, so pandas just kind of groups it all together. So. I just find it easy just to take each line and split it up and then just pull whichever one I wanted. So um, from this, I was just able to pull, you know, last line, storm name, et cetera. Um, and I didn't have to worry about really messing with pandas. So it's kind of like skipping for pandas and how it reads them. Um, and then I also use their data frame, which this I pulled is two-dimensional stuff. And it essentially creates a table of rows and columns. Oh, um, well, I guess a little. So Pandas is a Python data analysis library. Um, it was created by, I think, like a stockbroker or someone, someone finance the business side. Um, but it's, it's essentially uh, powerful data and stuff. Yeah. yeah, okay. Well, and this, you can kind of see how, like, it works in this. So, they have this, um, I guess, this uh, method called group by. And I use this a lot because when looking at the data, you just have to group by, like the models that I've already mentioned. So this command, you can group by one key or you can group by a list of things. So say if I wanted to group by model. So the key would be the column name. So say I wanted to group by model, then it would group all of the DFS, all of the name, all of so group them all together. Um, and then their data frame that um, you can select uh, rows, columns, also so just grouping them all together. And then I'll show a little bit more examples on this. Okay, so kind of created a mock table here just to kind of give you an idea. It's really standard in the data wrangling that they took a long time in line and on it, but then like multiple times a week. Um, so this is a table, kind of an example. So over here on the left, we have models M1, M2, and 3 
And I actually created this um, ensemble column. And I created that from this, the model information thing. So essentially, I said, if this is, I don't know if you remember, but one of the first DSS ensemble member, AP01. So if this was AP01, then I would say, put it in DSS. Um, and then each model had latitude, longitude. And then this forecast time group, which is kind of like, you know, this is forecast for zero hours, six hours out, et cetera. So you see how they're, how it's kind of split up. So plotting-wise, you have to group together by the forecast time, but then this list of latitude, longitude, you need all of those for just that one track for that one forecast time. So you see here M1, that's lat one, lat one, one, lat one, two. And then the same thing for M2, M3. So I had to group together by those, and that's just for time zero. And then for time six, you see, well, M2 has three points for that one, M1 has two points, and M3 doesn't have one for that. So you can see how each, each model had a different method and how Pandas really helped in grouping all those together. So it was a lot of you know, data grouping. So um, this is how I wound up grouping everything. So first, um, I had the user select the model and say they wanted to do the hurricane warp. So it would take all of the ones that had the ensemble H warp and then group together by the time, by the forecasted time group, and then sort through the ensemble members of those, and then pull out the log longitude latitudes in order and plot those. Um, and you'll see it when I start, when I do the demo at the end. Um, so now, how did I let the user select the model? Had I let the user select anything? I used what are called IPython interactive widgets. Um, and this is just kind of what I pulled from their documentation. Um, that kind of gave an example. So essentially, um, I found it very similar, similar JavaScript, JavaScript stuff, where they have like event handlers on click. Um, they don't have like any mouse over stuff. There are some differences, like the interactive widgets had on click chains. Um, so they can also be grouped together in containers, which you'll see later on. Um, and they can be made visible and visible. You can enable them, disable them, which helps me kind of put limitations on what the user could select, whether or not there was data for what they wanted to select or not. And um, that was also really helpful. So this is a screenshot of the storm cluster GUI. Um, so this is where the user could go and select the year that they wanted, then get the list of storm names for that year, then select the storm they wanted, and finally go to the plotting stage. So as you can see, these are all the interactive widgets. This is an in slider. So I found it easy rather than have a drop down menu of years from 1851 to 2014, just put a slider, have the user do whatever they want to do. And then when they click on the year, they, they get the storm names and et cetera. Um, I also, we also ran into some problems because obviously from like in year 1851, there probably isn't going to be a forecast stack file because there probably weren't any models to the forecast. So um, I had to make sure that the storm that they even selected that there was data for that um, or else they wouldn't be able to see it. So there's also a message that will pop up if there's no data. So this is the single track mode, meaning that the user can only select one model to track. Um, so as you can see, I, so this is now a new set of widgets. Um, so you don't see like the year widget anymore and stuff. So I've made that invisible and brought up some control widgets. Um, one of them being the time slider. So again, an integer slider over here. And some buttons to control the frame. Um, since at first I just had the slider and Ryan made the suggestion of having buttons because you know people want to be able to control that just a little bit more. Um, and again, a drop-down menu that drops down the list of models, or I guess more like it includes ensembles and then like the single pack, and so the user can select that. Um, one thing I did have trouble with was the length of this um, in slider, just because you know the UK might, might have 30 frames, but the DSS only has 12, and so I had to really read how many forecasted times each model had and then adjust the time slider or else um, there's, you know, from 12 to 30 you get 
over 15 errors because there's no data for that. And so that was a little tricky figuring out that part. And this is the multiple track mode. So now the user has selected this checkbox widget here that says add multiple tracks right over here. And now this old menu has been disabled to kind of guide the user to use the menu menu that's been created below. And then I've also created some new buttons to add track to add models. So the user can select the model they want and then they have to hit add new track in order to append that model to a list that will then create a dictionary for all the models or selected. Um, as you can see, we have a new plot title here that shows a list of the selected tracks. And you can toggle between modes in the bottom, the bottom inner, the widgets will disappear and then the top ones will be re-enabled. Um, so there's some interesting things that um, I also put in to have the base map change for each basin. So you saw the Atlantic Basin, but if the storm is in the East Pacific Basin, it will change the areas. Um, also, you can always return to select a new storm, and the storm selector widgets will pop up, and you can select a new year, select a new storm, and everything. Another thing, widgets cannot be deleted. So widgets are created in a widget area, and it's created, they're controlled by a small X on the side, and you can make the widget invisible, but the little the widget area is still there. So um, that was kind of a little bit complicated, having the storm selector widgets go away when the user was playing around with the models. Um, also, the lack of widget placement. Um, so as you saw, the buttons were on top of each other, which was a little awkward. I wanted them to be next to each other, but I could not find anything to move them around. So yes, you can put them in containers, but it kind of lifts them. There's no, like, I want this one to be on the left side, this one to be on the right side, if you can't really control it like that, or not that I could find. Um, and also, you the artist from that plot lib for tracks for we just change the data for each track rather than redrawing each new track line. Um, so just a faster plotting method that I that Ryan helps me with a lot. Um, and also I don't you probably didn't notice but the track colors they'll stay the same for in the multi track they'll stay the same for each model you choose. And if you toggle back to the single track, then the ensemble members will have different colors. Um, lines. And, oh yeah, and then there's a best track um, that stays underneath you know, what the storm actually did. So these are some groups that they can discuss that people can work off of. I left. Um, so I made a good point that some of them are a little bit obvious that kind of prompting people to really take action and be like, oh, this is kind of intuitive. I can fix this and get involved. Um, one is if you click on a model twice, uh, to on the multiple models, it will plot the model twice. So, so you could click on a model essentially three times, and you have three, three of the same models in the multiple model stuff. Um, also, it would be cool to change the track intensity. So, have on the track say it was a tropical storm in this section. On this part, it changed to hurricane, and then it diminished to tropical storm. Kind of changing colors within the line. Also, it's on a model legend, just kind of showing which line is which model. Um, which also helps. And yeah, now we'll go to the demo. Minimize. Reconnect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Thank <laughs> you. 
So we have three models. So the, now they're listed over here, the ones we've selected. 
might be a little hard. You can see. I don't know if you'll be able to see them. I'll scroll down a little bit. So, it makes a nice this one. Can see those. So, yeah, they're moving around. Yeah. Right, yeah. And I just really want to be fun to see next to each other, maybe have this move around, but... Yeah, I think there are ways to do it now with all the side by side. Um, you do that on the whole then uh wrap and go back to you are not locked in on the I did see a little bit on that, um, but I didn't really know if it could move it around. I think it was more like, you can change the color, you can change the font. This is a good briefing show that I found out about three weeks ago. I mean, there's everyone still thinking about it. And, you know, there's three weeks and there's a couple of CSS on the container. Maybe you can see if there's one that can change the width of the file app. You can select a new storm. And so now the storm selector widgets have come up. You can do a different year. Yeah. Right. And then they want to do Alvin, and then it'll go through all of it again. And yeah. um, this is, it's more like frames. Yeah. Um, I didn't really know how to label it. Maybe frame number would have been a good one, but. But all the put multiple models on there, they're all showing the same time. Right, so that was another thing. So one model might have, you know, increments from 0, 6, 12, or different increments. One might just have 0, 8. So I had to filter through when each model had data for that time. And then, okay, it has data plotted. It doesn't have data, don't plot it. So it's little, it's really, it's kind of, a lot of strainers kind of in way. <laughs> Well, mm -hmm. Oh, that makes sense. Just um, like how I made that line onto um, the projection stuff, or? I yeah, I guess. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so the base map. Um, it's projected the last launch onto the base map. Um, Any other questions? Right, so we did have um, some Ryan Garcia, the animation stuff um, that did have that. Uh, However, we went away from that just because we thought it might get too heavy for it. Um, right. So what it is is there's anything for the body model. There's a wrapper for that in the book. But what it does is make every frame of that animation and get it in the case. So that both makes the book big and make very Heavyweight to stay up. Every time you change something, it's going to be not to do one map of this building, but every frame is going to be So it's a function between the Partially, Partially, it's the way that using that building frame as opposed to, you could, if you looked into the browser and run some timers in the JavaScript, 
then we can break our own animation stuff in JavaScript to pick through the time bubble. That starts to involve the rest of JavaScript. I don't know of anything in the bill of this whole set of bubble. I'm sure, again, not impossible. I wouldn't call that one. We definitely noticed a big time difference in the animation stuff versus the button. A lot faster. One question is, what is the view of the model? How is the view of the model going to be affected by the comments? Yes. Um. Maybe the question is going to be more. Well, we did look at the IDD feature for like where they were getting their files and some ideas as well, like adding the multiple models. Um, Thank you. 
certainly serves as a model for you know, doing more advanced things. Where again, you can set this up. You don't have to use a plugin. You set up this running on a free um, that has an Amazon off of the data local and do all the analysis. There was something heavy to weight in there. Local group of data properties. Right. And that's what happens with this is a lot of
I'm sorry, what was it that I was talking about? What was your experience at Unidata? Um, <laughs> like on the personal side or you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I really enjoyed it. Um, I thought it was a, a great experience again, you know, like last year. Um, one thing I really enjoy is being in the, I guess, the research lab environment because there's, there's always so much, you know, development going on, you know, not only with Unidata stuff, but, you know, the, the other departments around UPAR and just being around people who are like, you know, at the the forefront of you know, what's going on. And I, I really enjoy that. And then, you know, I, I love it out there in Boulder. You know, it's beautiful and, you know, it's where I'm looking for grad school also. So, you know, I just like being out there in the area and, you know, I, I hate that I had to come back early, but, um, you know, like I said, it's a great area, a great environment. And you know, I really enjoyed it. Is there anything you would be willing to enter the future in the better experience area where you can do better? I'm sorry, I couldn't make out what you were saying. Like speaking by the microphone. And he asked if there's anything that Unidata could do to make user insurance experience better? Um, not that I can think of. I mean, and there's, I mean, there wasn't anything in particular. I was like, man, I wish I had this. I mean, everything was, you know, as far as I could tell, went, you know, really smooth. And I mean, I didn't have any problems or anything. So, I mean, I, I no, I, I can't think of anything. Okay. Um, so my experience was equally nice. Like Sean said, um, Boulder, Colorado, amazing place. Never been here. Beats any summer I could ever have in Texas. So it was awesome being here. Um, I really enjoyed the environment as well. I mean. Just like today, like someone can present an idea and there's going to be discussion, like you could try this, what about this? I mean, just the community effort within, I think, is really fantastic. And the fact that you are all very, you know, you know, like the users could, would want this, or this would be easier for the users. Um, so just the fact that there's a community effort within to help the community outside, um, I like how there's that dual stuff. Um, and I think one thing that I would say that could help future interns, I know so it's kind of this week I've been going around kind of learning about different programs because, I mean, I only worked with the notebook. Um, and, I mean, I loved what I worked on. I mean, I had fun every day. Sundays was like, yeah, I get to go to work tomorrow. Um, so it was really enjoyable. And, I, I mean, one thing I liked about programming is you get a hit run and you see all the stuff happen. So it's awesome using the widgets and hitting a button and have everything happen. So um, my I really enjoyed my project. I thought it was exciting. Um, but it was it was equally exciting to see what everyone else was working on. So like yesterday, Michael was talking about it was huge impact. Um, you wanted to discuss IDV and stuff. So just kind of, mm, kind of visiting around and get an idea. And I think that would be that would be fun to definitely like 
put on their agenda. I don't know if Don had the opportunity to do that, um, or if you did last summer. Don, did you do that? Mm -hmm. Um, I kind of did, but I mean, I didn't. I mean, I, I don't guess I spent you know a good bit of time doing it. I think. Right. So I mean, like Tuesday mornings every week would be fine. You know, this Tuesday you're going to go with so and so. This Tuesday, yeah. Yeah. 